Hello and welcome to Great Lakes In Depth. I'm Rick Mixter and today we'll embark on several adventures. First, we'll travel to Michigan's Thumb. Some consider this to be the most dangerous place on the Great Lakes. We'll show you one ship that found this out the hard way. Then we'll investigate a phantom shipwreck that is finally visible again. This former turret ship is no stranger to disaster. We'll show you why. And does this prehistoric looking fish look like a lawyer? Some thought it did as the lawyer fish carries several names. We'll meet this freshwater cod in our creature close-up. All that and more on this edition of Great Lakes In Depth. We'll be right back. Great Lakes In Depth is brought to you by Viking, the professional diver's choice for staying warm in the Great Lakes. Countless military and law enforcement dive teams count on Viking in extreme conditions. Shouldn't you? Also by International Software Engineers, creators of the Edmund Fitzgerald Interactive CD-ROM, the first and only source for everything you need to know about the Great Lakes' largest shipwreck. And by Jay's Sporting Goods, outfitting you and your family for the outdoors for over 30 years. Trust in the tradition. Jay's Sporting Goods. The Great Lakes are littered with countless ships, all taken before their time. Killer storms and blinding fog have taken their toll on shipping, and they seem to collect in certain areas like Whitefish Point and the tip of Michigan's thumb. It was here that the steamer Philadelphia was plowing its way through thick fog, loaded with coal and equipment that included stoves tied to her deck. The Philadelphia would never finish its Buffalo to Duluth run. Near Point Au Bark, an area the French called Point of Boats, the steamer slammed headfirst into the steamship Albany. The Albany was believed to be the worst damaged, and the crew jumped on board the 236-foot Philadelphia for rescue. The Albany was tied off and towed, only to remain afloat for another half hour. The line was cut as the bow of the Albany rose up and plunged to the deep. The Philadelphia now carried 47 sailors, and it was determined that it, too, was sinking. Two lifeboats were packed with crewmen, with no room for the captain and chief engineer's dogs. The two animals were abandoned on a ship running full steam into the fog. Some believe it was the Philadelphia's uncontrolled propeller that capsized the number two lifeboat, killing 23 aboard. The captains of both ships and 21 other sailors made it ashore. Newspapers and the courts were kept in suspense by the silence of the men who had survived the collision. The mystery of what happened to the ill-fated lifeboat deepened when a survivor was found by the barge Dunford. He went into hiding until the official inquiry of the collision was over. Today the Philadelphia lies upright in 130 feet of water. The mark of her collision is visible off the bow, and the stove cargo is still fastened to her deck. Herbert swims slowly along her machinery and near the giant propeller, which spun even as she took her death plunge.
The crew managed to escape this watery tomb, only to have half of them lost in a lifeboat accident. But somewhere nearby rest the remains of the two watchdogs, left howling on the deck as the ship vanished from view. Diving the Philadelphia means taking some extra precautions. It's deep, dark, and cold. Nitrogen narcosis, or getting narked, is a constant problem as the brain is intoxicated by the nitrogen you breathe as you go deeper. No one knows for sure why it makes you feel drunk, but the numbing feeling creeps up on you, and you start to lose touch about where you are. You really don't care what's going on around you. Uh, you're not aware of what's going on around you, and you don't care. You run into problems of running short on air, and uh, at that point, in 124 feet of water, you don't want to run out of air. Recovering from narcosis is as easy as rising towards the surface. The drunk goes away as you ascend. A good hit of narcosis gives you real respect for what many call the rapture of the deep, and only extensive training and advanced dive ratings can make you fully prepared for its effects. The Philadelphia is located close to sport diving limits, that is 130 feet, so extreme caution is urged as you visit this one-of-a-kind shipwreck. Much has been written about the gales of November, and perhaps the Edmund Fitzgerald made this time period the most infamous sinking in 1975. But countless other ships have been lost during this treacherous month, including the Panama. November gales were certainly on their minds when the winds kicked up for the crew of the Panama. The worst storm ever took several lives in four ships just a few months prior in 1905, and no one knew if this year's tempest was going to match it. The Panama was loaded with Minnesota iron ore, towing the barge Matanza for the lower lakes. Part of the Davison fleet, they called Bay City, Michigan home. The Panama would never make it home, as the storm raged as they approached Upper Michigan near Ontonagon. The captain would later report that the rudder broke as they battled the storm, and the schooner barge was cut loose when they were within sight of the port. The rocks on Mineral Point snagged the steamship, never to let go. Soon the upper works of the ship would be washed away, and the crew took their chances going ashore. A fishing tug managed to pull the Matanza to safe port, and they quickly turned around and went for her partner. The crew of the Tramp wouldn't find anyone on board the Panama, and they thought the worst. Thankfully, the crew was safe in Ontonagon as the Panama broke up in place. Today, the 237-foot steamer is only bones. A keel and part of the hull remains as yet another marker for the gales of November. Snorkelers can visit the wreck, but be prepared for a swim. The wreck is farther out than it appears, and dress warm, as Lake Superior is never known for being comfortable. Schools of suckers swarm the shipwreck, and spikes break the surface to show the rocky point that allowed the crew to get to safety. Don't expect to find much here, as the cargo and machinery was an easy salvage in only 10 feet of water. Few divers have taken time to explore here though, and you never know what you might see. That weird looking fish is called a burbot, others called a ling or a lawyer fish. Call it what you will, this codfish is certainly interesting. Anglers who have caught this eel-like fish note that they are slippery, squishy, and resemble something that should be a fossil. The burbot is found all over North America, from Ohio north to Canada and Alaska. 
it likes cold, deep water, and divers find this fish to be sluggish and easy to handle. Burbot is a member of the cod family, and it is the only member, the only freshwater member of that family. It's found primarily in the deeper waters of the Great Lakes, down in the cold layer, uh, and it uh, is sort of a neighbor down there to the sculpins and the lake trout. Looking like a cross between a catfish and an eel, it surely wasn't a compliment when someone nicknamed it a lawyer fish. Burbot has kind of a bad rap with commercial fishermen. They call it a lawyer, uh, and I, I, in deference to the attorneys out there, I won't get into the reasons why, but uh, uh, it is not often caught on hook and line uh, because it lives so far down in the lake. Uh, it is sometimes caught through the ice by ice fishermen uh, searching for walleyes. Uh, and it is sometimes caught by perch fishermen who are fishing in 50 feet or more of water. The burbot does have its advantages as it is one of the major predators of the ruffy. Invading the Great Lakes during the mid-1980s, the European ruffy reproduces quickly and is a threat to other species. Burbot are uh, kind of omnivorous, but they do eat a fair amount of fish, and they can be predatory on the young of some other fish. Uh, for the most part, they, they live on uh, sculpins. They live on uh, their own young to some extent. Uh, they will also occasionally eat young lake trout or young whitefish. Burbot are one of the longest lived of the fish that live in the Great Lakes. It's not at all unusual to see them live past 20 years of age. It's difficult to age them because uh, uh, unlike other fish where you can use the scales, you have to use the otolith or ear bone from the burbot, make a section of it, and count the growth rings inside that section under a microscope. Some anglers love to eat these freshwater codfish, saying they taste like lobster when steamed and dipped in butter. The burbot is a delicacy in Scandinavia. We prefer to leave this Jurassic throwback right where it is as a guardian of many of the Great Lakes shipwrecks. Breakwaters are designed to calm the waters around the inlet of a port or channel, allowing ships to get in when the weather gets bad. It seems ironic that building a breakwater would mean the end of the salver. The salver was no stranger to storms, having survived the king of storms in 1913. Then called the turret chief, the ship grounded off the Keweenaw Peninsula in a killer gale that took 240 sailors and over a dozen ships. The turret chief's crew were saved as were the men aboard the turret cape, and many believed it was the rounded deck of these ships that got them through the storm. Huge waves pounded the Great Lakes for three days. Ted Bullard rode out the storm as a young guest aboard the turret cape. Obviously, when we got in the neighborhood of Goddard, Ontario, there was no possibility of getting in there. At that time, the waves were anywhere 35 to 40 feet high, the worst they had ever, ever, ever been and the wind was up to 70, 80, and 90 miles an hour in spasms. The steamer Wexford was near Bullard, trying to make port in Goderich. Its whistles were finally silenced as it plunged to the bottom of Lake Huron. The Wexford still hasn't been found. Ted remembers finally making port and being greeted by the whole town when they sailed in. When we pulled in there, the town band was down there. I would say that most of the citizens of the town were there cheering and waving us in. The turret ships had beat the odds, and the turret cape went on to sail for many years. Well, I just have to say that we were the luckiest people in the world. And again, the type of ship that we were on was the answer to our being saved. The turret chief would sail under her own power for 20 more years. Then its engines were removed and she was cut down to a barge with only room for the crew and cargo. Renamed the Salver, the barge was under tow by the tug Fitzgerald when the waves and wind picked up in 1930. Loaded with tons of boulders from Detour, Michigan, they battled for port in Muskegon. 
they nearly made it to safety when the tow line snapped and the Fitzgerald limped into port to the cheers of onlookers. The crew of the Salver weren't so lucky, and some even climbed into the tall steel derricks to escape the icy waves. Two of those three sailors in the derricks would be rescued. Five others wouldn't make it, including two sisters and a nine-year-old girl. Today, the boulders still lie on what is left of the hull of the salver. Constantly being covered and uncovered by shifting sands, the shipwreck is rarely visited by humans. Burbits now nap where the crew once slept, and there is little left to recognize, save a few metal plates rising up from the bottom. The turret chief may have survived the worst storm of our century, but destiny would only allow her a name change and conversion before Mother Nature would finally take this turret ship for good. Shifting sands cover and uncover the salver annually, so there's no telling what you might see each time you dive the wreck. Sometimes you might not find the wreck at all. It may seem strange to non-divers that we wear as much as 30 to 40 pounds to get us down to the bottom of the Great Lakes. Weight belts come in many shapes and sizes and now many of them are integrated right into the equipment that we wear. Lead weight is needed because divers and their suits are buoyant or float when immersed in water. Divers need lead-filled belts to sink and inflatable vests called buoyancy compensators or BCs to go back up. Filling and emptying the BC lets you become weightless underwater. When you're going down, you got to get the air out of that ja jacket because it has that flotation. That BC, when you, add, and when you start dumping the air, it'll actually deflate that jacket, thus giving you that uh, negativity to get down to that shipwreck. Deciding on the right amount of weight takes trial and error. It's going to take a, a diver roughly about four or five dives before they're pretty much at the point that they are comfortable and neutral under the water with the weight. The ultimate goal is to be neutral, neither rising or falling in the water column. It makes for a more relaxing dive. It means less air consumption or less breathing that you have to do to move around. So the energy level, you're going to save a lot more energy, giving you more time under the water. 
Normal lead belts are sometimes coated to protect the divers and their boats, and many divers are using soft belts with adjustable pouches. It's designed as a section of pockets that you can open and put lead shot pouches inside of it for travelers. Uh, the lead shot is one of the most comfortable leads because it's going to contour to the, uh, your hip structure or your body structure itself. So it's going to be the most comfortable system out there. The latest trend is to integrate the weights into the BC. The integrated weight systems, you have pockets that would literally hold the weights. If it's soft weights or if it's the hard coat in hard weights, it doesn't really matter. They will slide in. Each belt is designed for easy ditching, so the diver can cut his weight and rise to the surface in an emergency. Colorful belts are easily retrieved, but the pouches can be an expensive replacement. Keith says it beats the alternative. Your life is more precious than $60 worth of lead. Now let's take a look at what's coming up in next week's show. Next week, we'll travel to Canada's number one dive destination. Located on Lake Huron, Tobamori has nearly two dozen wrecks within its boundaries. We'll investigate the sinking of the Arabia, a nearly intact schooner near Echo Island. We'll also explore the giant freighter Cedarville, which rests quietly near the Mackinac Bridge in Michigan. It's the victim of a horrible collision, as are several other ships in the Mackinac Straits. We'll take a closer look at this dangerous span of water in our next show. We'll also get a close-up view of a school of rock bass. These colorful fish are found throughout the Great Lakes, especially near wrecks. All that and more on the next Great Lakes In-Depth. I can't wait to show you Tobamore. It's truly a dive mecca for those of us who dive the Great Lakes. Well, that's about it for today's show. I'm Rick Mixter. We'll see you next time on Great Lakes In-Depth. <laughs>